outnumbered three to one were the 1,000 Allied fighter pilots. Some 110 of these famous few were Canadian. today uh, interview and we'll ask you uh, first to start off with your name. Yeah, my name is Leslie Weeks and my spelling is W-E-E-K-S, my last name. And I live in Burlington, at the east end of Burlington, on the lake shore. And I've been coming up to the museum for at least four years and I've been a member for at least three years. And uh, now I have been accepted to be a tour guide up here, which I enjoy very much. Great. Uh, and we're going to uh, roll back the camera for many years and talk about uh, going back into the 40s and how mm -hmm. you entered service. <coughs> mm -hmm. And uh, just like we talked when we were uh, sitting outside. So uh, if you can tell us your story. Well. I was 18 years old when the, uh, <coughs> when the war started, and um, I was actually 17, sorry, I was 17 years old. And um, of course, everybody was being apprehensive about, you know, what was going to happen, knowing how the Germans had been, you know, as a progressed in Europe, knowing that we were going to be on their list as well in England. And my home was in London, and in 1940, in October 1940, my home was destroyed by an aerial mine. This is a 2,000 pound type of bomb, but it is dropped uh, on a parachute. And when it um, touches down, instead of uh, be a, forming a big crater when it explodes, it just forms a saucer-shaped crater, and it uh, destroys by the blast that uh, exudes from it once it explodes. Uh, it landed in the garden of my house, and it blew the house away, and uh, most of the street as well. Um, in my home, there was eight of us, and uh, I was the only one to survive. The other seven were killed. And um, I had uh, two sisters, two brothers, brother-in-law, and mother and father were killed at the time. And I was lucky somehow that I survived, although I was buried under the house for about five hours. Um, they finally found me because it was in the dark, just after midnight. And uh, I had some injuries and I was hospitalized for a while. And, uh, but going on a bit, uh, after that I got well again and was discharged from the hospital. Uh, two months later, I joined the Air Force because there was a, a lot of glamour about the Air Force going in and it was being the youngest service of the three uh, services like the Army, Navy and Air Force. Uh, a lot more attention was being paid to it, uh, particularly because of our fighter pilots that were making such a good job in the air. And so I decided to join the Air Force rather than wait to be called up for the Army. So this is what I did. And so in, uh, I joined the, uh, the Air Force and um, I was posted to a reception center there. And uh, after I'd done my uh, ground training there and drill training and everything like this, which was initial training, um, I volunteer to become an armorer in the Air Force. Now, an armorer is a man, person that is taught how to um, uh, um, take guns apart, how to put guns back together again. You're taught all the type of ammunition that we use for all the types of guns that we used, and we were taught how to install these guns in the aircraft turrets and how to work on them, how to synchronize them with the gun sights. And this uh, course took about three months. And then from there on, uh, we were posted to a squadron. And uh, I was posted to a Spitfire squadron, which was number 91 Nigeria squadron. And we 
were only 26 miles from the nearest German fighter airfield across the English Channel at Calais. Our airfield was one called Hawkinge and it was above the town of Folkestone on the east coast, on the south coast of, uh, of Britain. And so we used to get a lot of um, visits from four ME 109s, which are Messerschmitt 109 uh, fighters, German fighters, and um, nearly practically every day they used to visit us. And? And um, they usually used to come over about in the, the breakfast time and at supper time, and I think the reason for that was they used to come across the channel at uh, sea level then they would hop up over the town and across the airfield and of course they were they used to strafe the airfield and they were um, each carrying a couple of bombs and so this they hoped to do a lot of damage on the airfield and also um, prevent some of the aircraft from taking off the, the fighters but um, one day they came over and they destroyed a lot of the hangars and they killed quite a lot of airmen and WAFs. WAFs are the Women's Auxiliary Air Force in the, in the British Air Force. <coughs> So if uh, around the base at that time, Bob, what was the feeling with the local people? What, what was the war effort feeling? The war effort was very upscale, I think, because um, they, they, everything, uh, our own uh, fighter aircraft were doing such a wonderful job that um, everybody was more or less upscale and about that we were going to win the war, even mm -hmm. at that time, I think, although there were was a lot of apprehension that, um, you know, to differ it, uh, but um, I don't know. Uh, I think it was very upscale at the time. And it's hard to get the British people down, isn't it? Uh, probably, yeah. That's what they always say on that. And you see, the thing is that, um, a thing I always uh, used to say about it is that um, the, when it came to the crunch, the English, the Irish, the Welsh, and the Scottish we all pulled together, we all got together because it was our island, right? And so we were going to defend it. And uh, so we did. And so um, I think uh, everybody was well into the war effort. Everybody was doing the best they could and the most they could with the least they had. And uh, I think we did a very good job, really. And uh, we were able to hold out, and which a lot of people, I think, sometimes don't realize that we were practically on our own from September 39 right up until December 1941 mm -hmm. when uh, through Pearl Harbor which brought the Americans in but uh, up to that time so you can say practically two years uh, we were going it alone in Britain and now, so now you uh, had Mr. Churchill's speeches yes did, did they rally people yes a lot I think he was the right man at the right time and um, he um, he did a great job and I think everybody rallied around him, uh, you know, and he was able to rally the people around himself as well. And he was able to um, bring out the best in the people, you know, and, uh, and bring out the, the best effort in the people as well, particularly in the factories and whatever that were producing all the um, armaments and uh, material for the war effort. And um, so I think really that did a great way to uh, people really being upscale all the time. Mm -hmm. well, let's move on to your training from mm -hmm. your, your postings from that point on. Okay, and in uh, going into the training and that, um, as I said, I was an armorer to a ground trade and I explained about what the Lord an armorer is. And um, I in 1940, in the beginning of 42, I was posted overseas to um, Egypt, the Middle East, and uh, we spent uh, eight weeks on the ship going, uh, going down there because we had to go in convoy. And so uh, I think there must have been about at least 5,000 people on the ship that I was on. It was called the Arundel Castle. And um, we actually um, went from England up to Scotland and then from there we went out across the Atlantic and we almost came across to the Canadian coast. Then we went down the Canadian coast, down the American coast, then we went right back across the Atlantic into uh, Sierra Leone, it's the Gold Coast on the west coast of Africa. And we were there for a couple of days and from there we traveled all the way around to Durban, which is on the southeast coast of uh, Africa. And we were there for about a month and then we were sh uh, on board ship again and then went up to Tufek or Port Suez in uh, the, uh, the canal. And the Red, it sits at the top of the Red Sea in the beginning of the Suez Canal. 
And from there we, de, uh, we disembarked and we were sent to this place called uh, Kasvarit and it was a reception center for troops and everything coming overseas. And from there, we were there for a short period of time and then I was posted up to another airfield called uh, Fed. And this was um, just part about halfway up the Bitter Lakes on the canal zone. And uh, from there, I was an armor across the ground trade. And from then on from there, I was working on um, Halifax bombers and Wellington bombers. Again, we did all the work that ten arm was supposed to do, like uh, synchronizing the guns and fixing the guns, all this kind of thing. And um, uh, while I was there, I volunteered to become air crew. So I uh, went and uh, found out some information about becoming air crew. And so I decided I'd like to be a gunner, seeing that I knew all about guns and aircraft and bombs and turrets and all this kind of thing. So um, I went to, uh, to um, see about how I went about getting into air crew. So they gave me all the information. We had to have an intelligence test, psychological test, aptitude test. And then, of course, uh, you had medicals to see if you were fit enough. And then if they decided that you were fit enough there, then they sent you on the course. And so uh, anyway, I got through all of that. And then I was posted to an air gunner school, which was number 13 air gunnery school. And uh, the name of the school was El Bala. And it was on the side of the Suez Canal. And it was about, um, uh, about 11 kilometers outside a town called Ismailia, which was on the end of the Bitter Lakes. And the Bitter Lakes were called that because there, there's so much salt in it that, um, you know, it's not like the Dead Sea where you can float on it, but you can't float in the Bitter Lakes, but it's very bitter. But anyway, from there, uh, our gunner, air gunnery course was six weeks duration. And from there, we, uh, we were taught um, how to, about flying. We were issued with a lot of flying equipment and stuff like this. And we were told what aircraft we were going to fly on to do our air gunnery. And so it transpired from there that uh, they would take up six UT air gunners, which UT means under training. And uh, we would go out where the aircraft we flew on there was um, Anson aircraft, Avro Anson. And six officers would go up at one, but we only had one turret on board. So we took our turns at um, doing our air gunnery. The way we did our air gunnery, Another aircraft towed a drogue, which was a, a white sleeve. You can see them at airfields there, like a, a, which uh, indicate the wind direction. And they were towed about 400 feet by, behind the aircraft. Aircraft depended on the ones we had available. Uh, sometimes it would be a fighter, sometimes it would be another, um, another Anson aircraft. So the way they determined the efficiency of our gunnery and our aim was that all the ammunition that was installed on the aircraft uh, was all in sequence. Now every bullet um, had either a yellow ring on it or a red die, a green die or a blue die. And then when each gunner had done his turn of firing at this drogue, as they called it, uh, we usually had about 500 rounds each. And then when all that, had, when each gunner had been on and done his turn at the air gunnery, then the, uh, the um, exercise would terminate. We would come back, land, and then the drogue would be taken in, and then it would be taken into the hangar, and then every shot that had been fired that had hit the drogue would be counted, so they knew exactly how many shots uh, each gunner had, because each gunner had a different color. And so this is how they determined how good you were at firing if it was an enemy aircraft. And so um, then they gave you a percentage of how many hits you had. And <clears throat> from there, uh, that um, when that course finished, you had a passing out parade, and there you were presented with your sergeant's tapes. So you, once you passed out your course, you automatically became a sergeant. And the, uh, you were also issued with your air gunner's brevi, and you were issued with your air, uh, air gunner's logbook. So in this logbook, you kept a, a detailed note of all your flights, all your operations, what they were, what uh, category you were, and all this kind of uh, data that they needed, and so that they could verify it. And then after each, um, after each course and each uh, detail in that, a summary was made up and it was signed by the command officer of the station. And 
So now when we, uh, when we did our, when we'd finished our air gunnery course there, um, I was posted up to Egypt, uh, to Palestine, I should say, and there went on to Wellington Bombers, and I was a tail gunner on Wellington Bombers. And again, we did our operational training, which was OTU, which meant Operational Training Unit. As a mother of John Gillespie McGee Jr., I have been asked to recite to you his poem, High Flight, which I myself dearly love. Oh, I have slipped the surly bonds of earth and danced the skies on laughter silvered wings. Sun with I climbed and joined the tumbling mirth of sun split clouds and then a hundred things you have not dreamed of, wheeled and soared and swung high in the sunlit silence. Hovering there, I've chased the shouting wind along and flung my eager craft through footless halls of air. Up, up the long, delirious, burning blue, I've topped the wind so tight with easy grace where never lark or even eagle flew. And while with silent lifting mind I've trod the high and trespassed sanctity of space, put out my hand and touched the face of God.